Next on Currents News, despite protests to protect the sanctity of life, terminally ill patients in New Jersey can legally end their lives starting today. There's strong Catholic opposition to the new law. The son of notorious terrorist Osama bin Laden is dead. Hazza bin Laden had a price on his head and was set to take over Al-Qaeda. A little girl horribly burned and then abandoned is in the U.S. tonight for a life-changing surgery, all thanks to a Christian missionary. Plus, the life of a priest changed when he decided to get in shape. Now he's preaching right. about fitness and faith. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Tamara Lane. Starting today in the state of New Jersey, terminally ill patients can legally end their lives. Supporters are hailing the law as a victory in the so-called right to die movement, but Catholic Church leaders are speaking out, saying it fails to protect the most vulnerable members of society, and they want the state to put more effort into improving its health care system. Morally unacceptable. That is what New Jersey Cardinal Joseph Tobin calls the state's new assisted suicide policy. The Medical Aid in Dying for the Terminally Ill Act went into effect today, allowing terminal adult patients to legally get medical help to end their lives. The new law, a direct contradiction to the Catholic Church fundamental teachings on the sanctity of all human life. And Catholic leaders are speaking out. Cardinal Tobin explaining that suicide should not be a viable option with today's medical advancements. Dying patients who request euthanasia should receive loving care, psychological and spiritual support, and appropriate remedies for pain and other symptoms so they can live with dignity until the time of natural death. New Jersey is the seventh state in the U.S. to adopt the deadly policy. On the day the bill was signed, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy said the legislation allows terminal patients to make end-of-life choices for themselves. Many fear the laws will be abused, with protests popping up around the nation in states that have adopted the policy. Bishop James Cecchio of Metuchen believes this law could particularly hurt the elderly. With this new law, the elderly could feel undue pressure to view this as an option to prevent being a burden to others, and young people will begin to think that people can and should be disposable. At least 19 other states are considering physician-assisted suicide bills. Under orders from America's bishops, Catholic hospitals and healthcare facilities are barred from having anything to do with assisted suicide. Catholics in California are mobilizing tonight to defeat a bill requiring some state colleges to provide medications for abortion. San Francisco Archbishop Salvatore Corleone, seen here in a pro-life pilgrimage, is calling for the proposed law a dangerous and unprecedented. Awaiting final approval, the measure would force public colleges and universities to provide drugs that induce abortions in pregnant women. Archbishop Cordelion is urging a novena to Our Lady of Guadalupe for her intercession to halt the bill. He also wants Catholics to lobby lawmakers. Catholic Charities in New York Archdiocese is warning tonight that family separations at the U.S. southern border are growing again. The organization said it is seeing steady streams of children flowing into New York, describing many as too young to understand what's happening or how to find their parents. After a federal judge ordered the Trump administration to stop separating children and parents last year, the number of kids coming to New York fell. A Catholic Charities official said the White House seems not to care about the court's order. The Democratic debates are over for now, round two wrapping up late last night, and some New Yorkers took to the showdown stage. The state's U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand and New York City's Mayor Bill de Blasio. It was also former Vice President Joe Biden's turn. The presidential prospects ganged up on the frontrunner, but Biden didn't shy away from the fight. Karen Kaifa has the highlights. Coming into this debate, all eyes were on center stage. The front runner, former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris of California, and whether the two would have a rematch of their clash in Miami last month. 
Biden came in with more energy, his aide said, and more prepared with lines of attack against Harris and the other person standing center stage with him, Senator Cory Bucker. But in the end, Biden ended up taking fire from just about everyone on the stage. Diversity on full display as candidates take the stage. The opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes masks. <laughs> Former Vice President Joe Biden standing front and center and feeling the heat. You want to be president of the United States. You need to be able to answer the tough questions. Especially from Senator Kamala Harris, with whom he clashed in the first debate. Go Giambi, kid. Right off the bat, Harris and Biden sparred on health care. The senators had several plans so far. You can't beat President Trump with double talk on this plan. Unfortunately, Vice President Biden, you're just simply inaccurate. For a Democrat to be running for president with a plan that does not cover everyone, I think is without excuse. Senator Cory Booker deflecting Biden's attack on his criminal justice record. You're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. And Representative Tulsi Gabbard setting her sights on Harris. You were in a position to make a difference and an impact in these people's lives. You did not. Democrats also debated issues like climate change. Too little, too late is too dangerous. And we have to have a bold plan, and mine has been called the gold standard. Racial injustice. It looks like one of us has learned the lessons of the past, and one of us hasn't. I find it fascinating. Everybody's talking about how terrible I am on these issues. Barack Obama knew exactly who I was. And immigration. Kids belong in classrooms, not cages. As those in the back of the pack tried to make memorable moments that may boost their poll numbers and keep their campaigns afloat. The first thing that I'm going to do when I'm president is I'm going to Clorox the Oval Office. And those lesser known candidates, they have a higher threshold to meet if they want to be on the debate stage again for entry into the next round of debates in Houston in September. These candidates need to be polling at at least 2% in four national or early state polls that are approved by the DNC and also have at least 130,000 unique donors in 20 different states. In Detroit, I'm Karen Kafa. The heir to Al-Qaeda, the son of Osama bin Laden, is dead to American officials making the announcement. But the death of Hosma bin Laden, the man who sought to continue his father's terrorism legacy, remains shrouded in mystery. Details about where and how he died are as scarce as the information about his life spent in hiding. Officials believe that he died sometime in the last two years as a result of American operations. We know he had preached jihad, trained fighters, and was introduced as the voice of al-Qaeda, a quote, young lion to carry forth the cause. A massive gas pipeline explosion has rocked a county in Kentucky, killing at least one and injuring others. Troopers are describing the scene as otherworldly. The area is now completely void of grass and vegetation. Stacy Cohan has the latest from Lincoln County. It's so bright. A tower of fire shoots skyward from the site of a gas explosion in Kentucky. It happened around 1 a.m. Thursday. A nearby resident thought a plane had crashed. Our house started shaking. You heard a loud roar. You could feel the heat and see the light from the fire. One woman fleeing her home says the heat burned her skin and hair. When we were running the backs of my... Uh, it's just the heat from the, the flames. The heat from the flames is, and uh, cinch my hair. Authorities blame a ruptured gas transmission pipeline. Lincoln County is about an hour south of Lexington, where some reported seeing the fire spout. Cars, asphalt, and railroad tracks melted. The searing heat also claimed the life of a 58-year-old woman. But after looking at the scene, police are grateful so many survived. The houses that are there are completely destroyed. And as you can imagine, at 1 o'clock in the morning, most people uh, are inside asleep. Uh, and so this could have been much, much worse. The area is void of trees, grass. One of the people that were there in the scene earlier described it as looking more like Mars. Some residents may be able to return to their homes or whatever is left of them Thursday afternoon. Stacy Cohan, Currents News. The father of an American teen accused of murdering an Italian cop and devout Catholic is standing by his son tonight. Finnegan Elder's father, Ethan, arrived at the Italian prison in Rome earlier this morning. He did not comment on the case. Prosecutors say his 19-year-old son has confessed to the crime. The attack allegedly occurred during a scuffle as the police officer tried to retrieve a backpack filled with cocaine. The Chinese Communist government seems to be sending an ominous warning to pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong. 
A new video is showing troops practicing riot control tactics in Hong Kong. The scenes are of China's army stationed in the Hong Kong garrison. The commander of that unit said the violent protests in the city should not be tolerated. For weeks, protesters have taken to the streets to denounce Hong Kong's pro-Beijing leadership. Sri Lanka's top cardinal Malcolm Ranjith is telling the government to launch an independent investigation into the Easter Sunday bombings that targeted churches. The cardinal is saying he has no faith in the probes that have been conducted so far, and he won't meet with any of the country's presidential candidates until his demands are met, adding that there has been a clear attempt to hide the truth about those responsible for the terror attacks that killed 263 people. Meanwhile, the government is offering free visas to visitors to revive the country's tourism industry. Following in the footsteps of the Holy Father, two top cardinals took a mission trip to visit a Rohingya refugee camp this week. Cardinal Luis Toggle, head of the Global Catholic Relief Agency, Caritas, and Cardinal Charles Bowe, the president of the Federation of Asia Bishops Conference, traveled to southeastern Bangladesh. The cardinals talked to the persecuted Muslim refugees within the camps and met with volunteers and staff who are helping to provide basic necessities. Pope Francis visited the Rohingya during a papal trip in 2017. There's a lot more news headed your way. A little girl is getting a big chance at a new life. The child has endured a lot of pain, but that's changing. We'll tell you how. Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio is here to weigh in on politicians who are trying to break the sacred seal of the confessional. A Queen's priest faced a life or death right decision. His choice has led to a mission of fitness and faith. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. Police are hunting at this hour for whoever vandalized a Catholic church in California. The word rape spray painted on several parts of St. Francis of Assisi in Bakersfield. I pray for these people who did this evil thing. That's Annie Aguilar, a St. Francis of Assisi parishioner. The paint covered the church's front doors, staircase, and bulletin board. And a trash can was set on fire. The crimes coming just days after the Bakersfield Police Department closed their investigation of sexual misconduct allegations against Monsignor Craig Harrison without bringing any charges against the priest. A California bill that would have required priests to violate the sacred seal of the confessional has been pulled by its sponsor after a state Senate committee raised First Amendment concerns. The attack on the sacrament is a big concern for Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio. He talks about that with Ed Wilkinson. Ed? Thank you. We're going to talk today to Bishop DiMarzio about the recent controversy over the seal of confession. And Bishop, in some states they were trying to do away with the seal of confession, especially when it comes to uh, crimes of sexual abuse. It, they, we would, they, California was trying to make a law that they've, they've pulled back on now, but uh, if a priest had heard about abuse in a confessional situation, they wanted them to report that to civil authorities. Where does the church stand on something like that? Well, obviously, the seal of confession is inviolate. I mean, you know, people have to risk their lives or, or to, uh, to, in order to protect it. And I think there's big misunderstanding of what really happens in confession, or, and that people who are abused are going to confession and telling uh, the priest who they who they abused, or uh, murderers are going to confession and <laughs> telling the priest to, that they killed somebody and that these priests keep these secrets. I mean, it's a complete, uh, they looked at the movies too much. <laughs> this is not what happens, you know. Uh, it's very uh, uh, different, the reality. They don't understand the church. They don't understand the sacramental system. And there is an animus against the church in general, trying to destroy what we have, uh, trying to belittle what we have, like in, in a certain sense that the sacrament of confession is this license to do evil. Mm. It's not uh, for forgiveness and, and, and repentance. So that's the, the difficulty we're dealing with. Yeah, you mentioned this animus against the church. Is it because of the sexual abuse crisis, or is it something oh, that's uh, more deeply added, rooted? It's been added to by the sexual abuse crisis. It's always been there in our society. I mean, 
The Catholic Church has not ever had a good, easy time in our culture, uh, right from the beginning. And uh, there was a time, maybe in the last uh, 60, 70 years, it wasn't too bad, but we're back now in a clash, a culture clash with the culture which we are at in our society that mm -hmm. uh, we just don't fit in. Yeah. How do we begin to dialogue with society on things like this so that they can better appreciate who we are as a church? Well, again, every issue is a little different, but I think we have to state ourselves clearly that we have a right to uh, the public forum, as everybody else does, bringing our opinion. In the words of St. John Paul II, the church doesn't impose, it proposes. So we have to propose what we know to be the truth. Uh, and people accept it, don't accept it. We, that's not our job to force people. Uh, but to propose what the truth is, is what our, our job is. Yeah, we constantly hear about the separation of church and state, and how do we get the idea across that we're not talking about a separation from religion, but really, uh, you know, uh, freedom for religion to operate within us. Well, society. that's exactly the point. They, they, it's, it's a freedom to, to be, to practice our faith, to have a conscience in a society that sometimes deny conscience to people. You have to do whatever the, the law says or whatever we say should be done or what's the better thing. Uh, that That's the wrong uh, approach. We, we need to look at it much differently. Yeah, are we in danger of going down a slippery slope here because uh, the seal of confession is one thing. Are there other areas that we have to constantly be on guard against? There's no question about it. Uh, really, uh, the, the freedom that we do have can be eroded easily uh, by a society that's looking to uh, impose its values on us. We, we try not to impose on them. We just stand by our values. At the same time, even our enunciation of them, they think is an imposition. So uh, at the same time, they're doing this all the time. Mm -hmm. So this is the misunderstanding. Yeah, we, we, we don't seem to have many friends in the legislature these days. A lot of the things that are going on uh, really seem to be anti-church. Is there any hope for creating a better dialogue with those who are elected to office? Well, hope is what we are as Christians. We're hopeful people. We have to try. We have to dialogue. We have to, uh, to get involved with people so that they understand our position. That's our job. Good. Bishop, thanks so much for being okay. with us today. And now we're going to throw it back to the news desk. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio, for working so hard to protect the church. Burned and abandoned at the age of two, Elvina Kolevi has seen a lot of suffering in her young life. But now the little girl from the other side of the world has new hope thanks to the kindness of a Christian missionary. Tom Abrams has the story on the first steps of a new start. Implemented to ensure every day at Bush Intercontinental Airport, between 100 and 120,000 people <laughs> fly in and out of the country's fourth largest city and home to the world's biggest medical center. This is the best spot, believe me. On this last day of July, one of those passengers, oh, they're coming there, was taking the first steps in a journey that will change her life. Oh my God, they're here! Elvina Kolevi, four years old burned in an open flame at age two and abandoned because of it from a primitive village in Papua New Guinea, but coming home to people who love her. Welcome. Oh. Cletus Dillman is a Christian missionary who found Elvina. You cannot ignore the pain, especially in a place like Papua, it's very remote. And for more than a year and a half has been working to get her treatment for her wounds. I knocked many doors all around the world asking for help. And the first person that answered my call was Ms. Hashmat, the House of Charity. This is Ms. Hashmat, Effendi, a Muslim who runs a nonprofit healing home in Houston where Elvina will live for free for the next six months. Elvina will be the 275th child Effendi has helped. We will teach her how to take care of a house, how to clean, starting from personal hygiene, then grocery shopping. We will teach her English, we will teach her computers. It is very exciting. Texas Children's has donated the treatment, as many as three surgeries, which will transform Elvina. Still, it was expensive to bring her here. Dina Simmons came here from Arizona for Elvina's arrival and is leading the slow fundraising effort meant to pay for Elvina's flight, that of her caregiver, Kuto, and for another child still awaiting her chance. But we're excited for this life-changing thing that Elvina is going to get the, the help that she needs. First steps are often the most important. They are the most critical. Elvina, half a world away from the only place she's ever lived, is taking her first steps for a second time. 
Over $7,500 have been raised to help little Elvina. We wish her all the luck in the world. Still to come on Currents News, how a priest's wake-up call is producing a union of faith and fitness in Woodside, Queens, and why thousands of scouts are coming to see the Pope. And the tablet has a brand new page called Our Diocesan Family, where you can share your pictures of recent baptisms, holy communions, confirmations, marriage, all the joyous sacraments. For more details and to submit your photos, go to thetablet.org slash Our Diocesan Family. Your picture may be published in an upcoming issue of the newspaper. We'll be right back. A different set of troops are invading Rome this summer. More than 5,000 boy and girl scouts will arrive at the Eternal City this Friday. The group, filled with scouts between the ages of 17 and 21, are currently on a five-day pilgrimage that will follow the historical routes of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Benedict, among others. Along the way, they'll stop and pitch tents, gathering to discuss Europe, human dignity, and liturgy. Pope Francis has greeted the scouts before at St. Peter's Square in 2015. In particular, I want to offer a contribution important to the families for their mission of education to the fanciulli, the young and the young. After an audience with Pope Francis, the Scouts will go to Mass at St. Peter's Basilica. Finally tonight, for one priest in the Diocese of Brooklyn, getting in shape was a matter of life and death. What he found on his transformation journey was not only fitness, but faith. Currents News' Emily Druby reports now he runs a fit club where workouts also build virtue. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, give yourself some room. From stretching to jumping jacks. One, two. Father Henry Torres motivating St. Sebastian's youth to get in shape through the Woodside Parish's popular summer fit club. Father Torres knows just how important personal health is. I was almost 200 pounds, you know, and my doctor looked at me and he said, that's, you're getting ready for disaster. This is the last time I tell you this, so you need to make the change. I'm doing my part, he told me, as a doctor in the medical field to keep the kidney going. Now you have to do your part for the longevity of it. And it was a wake-up call. After surviving two kidney transplants, Father Torres' doctor making it clear that losing weight wasn't an option. It was a matter of life or death, so he did something about it. Losing almost 50 pounds in a year by working out and eating healthy. And my doctor called me. He goes, your blood work is excellent. Continue to do what you're doing. It's excellent. So I'm, I'm excited. I feel good. Now he's sharing that mission with the youth, getting them outside and moving during the summer months. If you weren't here at Fit Club, what would you be doing? Eating junk food, uh, hanging out with my friends, um, watching Netflix. But they're not just exercising their physical muscles. This workout class also exercising kids spiritual muscle. Do not be afraid. Dedicating the last half hour of the club to discussions about their faith and how it connects to fitness. Discipline and consistency is important to develop your spiritual life and your physical life. An aspect popular with attendees. And getting more involved in their religion and finding God while playing and still being kids. It's amazing. Proving God can move you in many ways. In Woodside, Emily Druby, Currents News. That is Currents News. I'm Tamara Lane. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.